Welcome to part two of the orientation from Alberta Waste and Recycling. Let's get started. So in this part of the orientation, we will go over the four critical errors, uh, reporting and investigations, decisions that can change behavior, hierarchy of controls, distractions, eyes and mind on task, complacency, rushing, frustration and fatigue, emergency response, equipment maintenance program, hazard assessments, safety meetings and safe work procedures, harassment and violence, health and safety committee and occupational health and safety legislation or OHS legislation. The four critical errors or mistakes that increase the possibility of injury are rushing, frustration, fatigue and complacency and those cause eyes or the errors are eyes not on task, mind not on task, line of fire, balance grip and traction. So types of hazards are close calls, minor and major, and that correlates directly with hazards that are close calls, minor and major. As you can see by this triangle, it's a hazard triangle. So near misses are at the bottom. Incidents and first aids are next. Incident investigations, usually WCB or OHS. Major incidents with lost time. And then at the very top of the pyramid is fat fatalities. What are near misses? Near misses are slips, trips, falls with no injuries, almost accidents, almost equipment damage, almost property damage, almost injury. Anything that may happen but didn't. And we report these on the near miss form. And on that near miss form, we go over the date of the near miss, description of what you were doing or the task that was being performed, description of what happened, what acts or conditions affected the potential incident, ice, um, uh, unsteady feet, uh, improper uh, footwear, etc. Whether vehicles, people, and equipment, and then we go into how do you think this can be prevented. Incidents are vehicle and equipment damage or destruction, property loss or damage, worker injuries, first aid, medical clinic or OIS clinic, uh, hospital, occupational illnesses, work refusals, and spills. The key with spills here is if you have a spill, you must accompany it with a spill form. So there's a product release form and an incident report. Those both must be um, completed for a spill form. So an incident report form is the date, time, name of site location, type of incident, worker injury was the doctor seen, were photos taken, if so, by whom? and who, who else was involved other than yourself. Details of what happened, the more information, the better. Be specific and use facts. Sign your name and your supervisor's name, your supervisor's signature. This is then sent to the office for myself to fill out page two. Now on page two, there are what are the causes of the incident? What are the root causes? What are the recommended actions to prevent reoccurrence? Timeline for corrections? Who's responsible for those corrections and when are those corrections completed? The supervisor, safety officer, and senior manager all sign this and then the reports are reviewed by the Health and Safety Committee quarterly. Long-term injuries, occupational illnesses. Long-term injuries can be a part of working. Some examples are re repetition injuries, force injuries, positional injuries, vibration and noise injuries, standing, sitting for long periods of time, working with chemicals, weather. What are non-incidents? Non-incidents are things that happen that didn't create an incident. Illegal dumps, after hours minor damage, uh, resident complaints, wild animal sightings or actions on sites. No, the, so the non-incident form is pretty simple to fill out. The date and the site of the non-incident, the location on the site, so if you're at, say, North Calgary, where on the site did this happen? On the back row, by the scale shack, by the employee lunchroom, etc. The description of the non-event or the non-incident or the event. Other information that may be needed or important to know, i.e. weather, day of the week, time of the day. Priority of the non-incident, so very low, low, medium, high and then your supervisor and the safety officer assigns, and then this also is sent off to the HSC committee to be reviewed quarterly. 
When do investigations happen? Investigations happen when there is a serious incident, when there is a major incident, when there is a serious injury or fatality, when Alberta Waste and Recycling, City of Airdrie or Rocky View County request one, when OHS is involved or Occupational Health and Safety, also when WCB is involved um, if they request an investigation. Uh, these investigations can be completed by any member of the HSC committee and the safety representative or an investigator from the OHS, WCB or a supervisor or manager. What do I do during an investigation? Stay calm. Answer any questions with just the facts. Give appropriate information. Be very specific. Do not be afraid to report. Most importantly, be honest. Decisions can change behavior. Changing behavior is immediate if you decide to do so. You can decide to slow down. You can decide to wear your PPE properly. You can decide to pay attention or keep your mind on the task at hand. You can decide to look around and see what is happening around you. You decide, which is a change behavior, and there's an immediate response. Distractions. There are four types of distractions. There's visual distractions, which are signs and displays, flashes or bright lights, animals and scenery. Auditory distractions, cell phones, computers, clicking pens, other conversations and general noise. Manual distractions, which are displays, controls, items that move in your hand, navigation controls or maps. And then cognitive distractions, daydreaming, lost in thought and of course your emotions. Eyes on the task. Simple strategies for keeping your eyes on the task at hand is scan your area for tripping hazards prior to moving in any direction. Never put, a, put any body parts where you can not first visually scan. When walking, keep your eyes focused on the direction of your travel. Remember, how you hold an object can restrict the view of your path. Ask yourself, is what I'm standing on, walking on, the safest surface possible? Continually look for materials, equipment, rocks, loose gravel, or ice in your path. Ensure, your, ensure boots are appropriate for the task, in good condition, and worn properly. Sufficient lighting must be utilized when walking on uneven surfaces after dark. Ask for assistance with heavy or awkward shaped loads. Mind on the task. Some of the contributing factors that cause our minds to wander off is rushing, fatigue, frustration, complacency, anger, other emotions. These emotions and states can contribute to making to the making of critical mistakes. All your good habits and training can go out the window and risky behavior takes over. Not watching what we're doing, not concentrating on what we're doing, being in or moving into the line of fire, loss of balance, traction or grip, and then multitasking. There's no such thing as multitasking, by the way. You can do one thing at one time, or you can do a whole bunch of things at different intervals, but you cannot do them all at once. Complacency. Just because things are going well now doesn't mean they suddenly can't go horribly wrong. Complacency in the workplace is when you become so secure in your work that you take potentially dangerous shortcuts in your tasks. You don't perform to the same quality as you once did, or you become aware of or become unaware of deficiencies. Complacency can be a more major issues in injuries, industries like construction and healthcare, where it's important to remain vigil, vigilant and very aware of workplace hazards. It's important to recognize the signs of complacency so you can address and change the behavior. Here are some signs of complacency to watch out for. Disengagement, lack of investment in yourself or others, loss of passion for your work, dis disinterest in other opportunities or promotions, less thinking before action, shortcuts, frequent mistakes, minimal initiative or none at all, neglecting tasks and showing carelessness. Also comfort zones. The question to ask is, are you spending too much time in your comfort zone? Rushing. The dangers of rushing. Rushing is a characteristic of human nature. It's human nature to want to get a job done as quickly as possible. Getting a task done in a hurry gives you the ability to start your next task sooner 
in some cases, more time to do other things that may be more enjoyable. Many of us also grew up being told that it's important to accomplish as much as we can. But when, what we often aren't told is that rushing can result in accidents, errors, and more time spent in the long run. We need to do our jobs correctly and safely. As my dad would say, never do a job once, always do it twice. My dad was a procrastinator. Let's look, at, let's look closer at what can happen when you hurry. Rushing to get our jobs done can result in an injury to ourselves and those around us. Statistics from one insurance company show that 92% of the time, the reason accidents occur is because workers aren't doing their tasks properly. Being in a rush makes it unlikely you will perform your task as you should. Among the consequences of being in too much of a hurry are accidents involving yourself and coworkers, mistakes which, you can result, which can result in unhappy customers, the need to redo a task you thought was already done, product damage or loss. Rushing can also have long-term consequences. These include serious injury and long-term pain, costly medical bills, the possibility of a dis disabling injury, which could put you out of work, the loss of income from being out of work. Avoid rushing and develop a good safety attitude. Rushing results in carelessness and carelessness leads to accidents. One example of a poor safety attitude that you should avoid is, I don't have time to think about safety. I need to get this job done right now. Having a good safety attitude means taking responsibility for your actions and taking responsibility means doing the best job you can, not the fastest job you can. Hurrying do's and don'ts. Do think about the consequences of hurrying. Know that rushing can result in serious injury to you and your coworkers. Always take the time to put on safety equipment. Use the right tools and follow safety instructions. Dress properly for the job. It may take a few extra minutes to put on your safety glasses, hard hat, or other safety equipment, but it can save you from serious injury. Use the right tools for the job. Identify hazardous situations in advance. If you're rushing through a task, your mind is on getting it done, not on what may happen next. Don't remove safety guards or safety shields and continue to operate equipment without them. Don't have the attitude that you can hurry just this one time. Don't fail to take the time to read the operator's manual or heed safety warning signs. Don't be in so much of a rush that you neglect your personal safety or the safety of those around you. Our first priority is your safety. When we rush, we not only jeopardize your well-being, but we also sacrifice quality. In the end, this costs us all more time to get it right. Frustration and fatigue. Frustration. Taking, your, taking control of your frustrations and even adapting your perspective can significantly improve your mood and outlook on your job. Here are nine steps to consider if, you if you're feeling frustrated at work. Analyze the situation. Look for the bright side. Talk about it. Speak with your boss or your supervisor. Work-life alignment is important. If you're doing one, too much of one or too much of the other, it could be a problem. Set reasonable boundaries. Identify where you can make improvements. Communicate with coworkers outside of work. Concentrate on your skills. It is difficult to avoid frustration in life. However, you can learn to manage it efficiently. Managing feelings of frustration, like so many other aspects of life, isn't always easy, though it's well worth it in the end. Fatigue. Tired, weariness, or sleepiness. Drooping heads, incessant yawning, and eyelids that seem to be closing are the most obvious indicators that someone is fatigued and needs time to recover before costly errors or accidents happen. Irritability. Workers can be irritable for many reasons, including problems at home, financial stress, conflict with coworkers, etc. Another reason may be the lack of rest. It's a good idea to watch for patterns of irritability or a newly developed bad attitude, especially when combined with other signs on the list. Reduced alertness, concentration, or memory. Watch for workers who appear to have trouble focusing or can't recall seemingly simple things like what they just said or did. Having difficulty solving problems can also be an indicator of fatigue. Lack of motivation. 
Employees who appear to suddenly lack motivation to do their job and do it well may seem lazy, but this is a general sign of a broader issue, including fatigue. Increased mistakes or lapses in judgment. If a worker who is otherwise proven to be competent and good at their job starts making frequent errors or poor choices, it might be a sign of sleep deprivation or fatigue. Headaches. Headaches are a sign of a fatigue, but they can also be a sign of dehydration. Before deciding it's fatigue, make sure all workers are adequately hydrated on the job, even when it's not hot outside. Increased susceptibility to illness. Workers who are suddenly taking more time off due to illness may be experiencing fatigue. Insufficient sleep wears the body down and affects a person's ability to fight colds, flu, and other illnesses. With an increase in fatigue, it's not uncommon to see a rise in absenteeism. Emergency response. All sites have an emergency response plan or an ERP. You saw the maps earlier and all the sites must have a muster point a signal plan, which is three air horn blasts on all of our sites, a current on-site first aider, ID of the closest emergency services, including hospital, ID location of fire extinguishers and first aid. So the symbols we have are the muster point is a giant star, the first aid kit is a red cross, and a fire extinguisher is an um, oval. Our equipment maintenance program, mobile equipment and vehicle. Only those authorized and have competency completed by AWR's evaluator are permitted to operate mobile equipment. A pre-trip, post-trip must be completed each time you use a piece of equipment or vehicle. This is in a book located in each piece of equipment. Where there is damage, defects, or maintenance is to be documented and submitted to your immediate supervisor. Implement lockout tagout procedure on the equipment found unsuitable for use or does not meet manufacturer spec before locking out, speak with your supervisor. All hand tools and equipment must be inspected prior to each use. Where defects and damage is found or maintenance required, submit the completed form incident or non-incident to your supervisor immediately. Implement lockout tagout procedures on any equipment found hazardous, unsuitable for use, or does not meet manufacturer specifications. Safety. Safety meetings. Daily hazard control meetings provide communication to assess ongoing hazards and changing conditions. Documenting on the designated form and worker participation are mandatory components to these five to 10 minute maximum shift startup sessions. This provides all workers opportunity to participate in hazard identification and team input on what controls will be implemented. These brief meetings will also provide a designated time and collectively review any incident findings, monthly site inspection reports or maintenance program issues. Safe work practices and procedures. Safe work practices are documented controls that outline general do's and don'ts of common work activities such as using power tools or ladders. Safe work procedures are a series of specific steps that guide a worker through a task from start to finish in sequential order. Safe work procedures are company specific because each organization has different equipment and processes that make up a hazard in the operation. Just because you did something one way at one company doesn't mean you do that the same at another company. These written safety documents assist in implementing, an appro implementing appropriate controls to prevent injuries and incident. Potential hazards and controls. It is the regulated responsibility of Alberta Waste Recycling to identify potential hazards and related controls that may occur on the work site. Reference Alberta OHS Code Part 2. So the the hazards on our sites are dust and, dust and silica, strip, strips, slips, trips and falls, sharps protruding, protruding objects, pinch points, manual lifting, strains, traffic, fire hazard, wind, extreme weather, compressed gas cylinders, driving company vehicles. Hierarchy of controls. So the hierarchy of control starts with controls perceived to be most effective and moves down to those considered least effective. As defined by oh &S, it flows as follows. Elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then PPE. So elimination physically removes the hazard permanently. Substitution replaces the hazard. Engineering controls isolate people from the hazard or stops us from getting to the hazard. Administrative engineering controls are things like um, 
steps and whatnot. <clears throat> Administrative controls changes the way people work. So those are pieces of paper or signs. So stop signs, um, safe work procedures, safe work practices, those types of things are all administrative controls, something that we have to read in order to stop us from the hazard. And PPE is the last uh, line of defense and it protects the worker with PPE. It protects us, the PPE protects us from the hazard. So when we do our hazard controls, you can use any of you can use any of the uh, controls in combination. All right. So now we're on to workplace harassment and violence. Workplace harassment means any object objectionable or unwelcoming conduct, comment, or action that a person knows or ought to reasonably know will or would cause offense or humiliation to a worker but excludes any reasonable conduct of an employer or supervisor in respect of the management or the workplace. According to Alberta's or workplace violence, according to Alberta's Occupational Health and Safety Code, workplace violence means the threatened, attempted or actual conduct of a person that cause, causes or is likely to cause physical injury. Examples include the following, threatening behavior such as shaking fists, destroying property, or throwing objects, verbal or written threats, any expression of intent to cause harm, physical attacks such as hitting, shoving, pushing, or kicking. Domestic violence, a range of behaviors or actions taken by a person to control and dominate another person. This is characterized by abusive, coercive, forceful, or threatening acts or words used by one member of a family, household, or intimate relationship against another. Domestic violence can enter the workplace when an abuser attempts to harass, stalk, threaten, or injure a victim at work. Worker responsibility. Workers of AWR are required to be familiar with and follow the procedures that are in, the place, that are in place to protect their psychological health. All employees are to participate in the instruction of respect in the workplace training, which includes violence and, and harassment prevention, as well as domestic violence in the workplace. Workers have the responsibility to treat each other with respect. Workers are required to immediately report all violations of this policy to their supervisor. Workers are responsible to cooperate in the investigation of complaints. Details shall be kept confidential. Workers are responsible for participating in worksite hazard assessments and implementing controls and procedures to eliminate or control the associated hazards. If you're not comfortable speaking to your immediate supervisor, you're more than welcome to contact myself or Michelle Patrosh. Health and Safety Committee. The Health and Safety Committee must have four members with at least half representing the workers. Worker, re worker representatives are selected by the worker for a term of not less than one year and may continue to hold office until their successors are selected or appointed. Employer representatives are assigned by the employer. Worker co-chair is chosen by the worker members. Each committee must have two co-chairs, one employer and one worker. HSC committees are myself as the employer rep, Airdrie and truck drivers is Mike Pusine, our competency trainer, North Calgary rep is Maddie and Mike. Uh, Mike is a second in case Maddie is unavailable. Our Bray Creek representative is Danielle. Langdon rep is Red. Ear Canna and Chuck Wiggins is Robin Cooper. Committee rep phone numbers are listed on the AWR Health and Safety Committee member list. These are posted in lunchrooms, pay booths, or the Chuck Wagon doors. And finally, the OHS legislation or the Occupational Health and Safety Legislation for workers' rights. All Canadian provinces and territories have laws in place to protect the health and safety of workers. The laws provide all workers with the following three rights the right to know the right to participate, and the right to refuse unsafe or dangerous work. The right to know. about You have the right to know about the hazards in the workplace, including potential exposure and how to protect yourself. The right to participate. Through your health and safety representative or safety committee, by discussing health and safety concerns with your supervisor or your health and safety committee member. Right to refuse unsafe work that you believe is dangerous to your health and safety or that of another worker. Immediately report work refusals to your supervisor and follow the specific steps. So at AWR, the specific steps are, um, you report to your supervisor and if your supervisor thinks 
um, agrees with you, then they will call the safety officer and the general manager for an investigation on how to fix the problem. Um, and then we go from there. If your supervisor uh, re disagrees with you and assigns another member that does not think the same thing, then your, um, your notice is, is logged and uh, the safety officer will likely come out, myself will come out and take a look at the, at the situation. All right, any questions and concerns you have about this, please contact uh, Michelle Beddows directly. Um, my number is everywhere on the sites and at the chuck wagons. So love to hear from you. And again, welcome to Alberta Waste and Recycling.